ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Timothy McKnight. Hey, everybody. Welcome to week eight of our Fit for Life re review class. Hope you guys are all enjoying the nice warm weather. Uh, for those of you in north, central, eastern Ohio, we're enjoying some really beautiful weather and spring feels close. So tonight, uh, we're going to begin with an inspirational little clip that I came across a while ago. I love watching these clips of older people doing uh, really inspirational, motivational kind of feats. So I wanted to share with you a clip of a woman who is 103 years old and uh, setting a world record in the 100-yard dash. So let's see if we can call this up and you can watch this. Finally here tonight, who ever heard of a runner setting world records just a couple of years after taking up the sport? It turns out this beginner has plenty of life experience. At 103 years old, Julia Hawkins isn't slowing down. She's picking up the pace. Julia Hawkins, gold medalist. During this week's National Senior Games in Albuquerque, New Mexico, Hurricane Hawkins, as she's known, won gold in both the 50 and 100 meter races. That's not all. The sprinter set a new USA track and field record as the oldest woman to compete on an American track. I hope I'm inspiring them to be healthy and to realize you can still be doing it at this kind of an age. Hawkins is no stranger to breaking records. She started her running career at age 100 and quickly racked up three world records by 102, including in the 100-meter dash. She told reporters at the time she skipped her nap to make that race. I thought it'd be neat to run at 100 and uh, do the 100-yard dash. Her training secret, gardening at her home in Louisiana. Every day when you're hungry, sleep is in your Hawkins says she competes to impress her family, but with this drive and a few world records under her belt, she's on track to impress many more people than that. And we can all learn a lot right there. So I hope that inspired you. Um, you know, she's, uh, she didn't start running until she was 100 years old. So some of you may have a few years before you have to start training, but uh, uh, what a great attitude, what a great message. Um, I wanna share a, another message with you because uh, I, I think it's important. I feel a responsibility, a duty to share this uh, with people in Fit for Life because it means a lot to me, and I, I, I just feel an obligation to share the story. Uh, this is a picture of my uncle on the left and my father on the right. My uncle was 18. My father was 17 when he uh, enlisted in the Marines, he was right out of high school. And my uncle, who was a year older, had already been in the Marines. Uh, this is 1944, towards the end of World War II. Uh, my dad wanted to serve his country. My uncle uh, drove the Amtraks, the transport uh, boats that take the Marines from the ship to the shore, uh, and he was on Iwo Jima. And he, he's 95 now. He doesn't talk about his war experiences, um, I think partly because of the bodies and wounded that he had to carry back from the beach. Uh, he doesn't talk about it, but my dad does talk about his experiences. And I wanted to share a few stories from what he went through as a combat Marine on the island of Okinawa. He was a machine gunner and uh, he was stationed um, in on Okinawa, which was the, actually it turns out it was the bloodiest battle and more casualties on both sides, including civilians than any other battle in the Pacific. Um, and there were more ships lost 
uh, through kamikaze attacks off the uh, island of Okinawa that my dad was witnessing as he was on the ship ready to be transported to shore. He just wanted, he told his friend he wanted to get off the ship and dig himself a nice foxhole because he was watching the kamikazes attack and sink a lot of the ships that were waiting to land. So this is the landing craft. This is my dad's uh, riding. Uh, this is the second landing on the southern end of the island of Okinawa that trapped the Japanese, but they still put up a fight. So he fought on the lower, the south end of Okinawa just at the end of the war. Uh, but I wanted to tell you a story about his, his two buddies. They, they met in uh, boot camp, uh, Bob McTurius from Altoona, Florida, and Don Mahoney from Massachusetts, and then my father, and they became good friends in boot camp. And when they got to the island of Okinawa, they got separated. And uh, so uh, this is a picture of Bob, this guy on the left, with his parents uh, in November of 1944. This was after their basic training. They got a, a short leave for about 10 days to go back home, and then they left for combat, and this would be the last time that Bob would see his parents. Uh, this is a, let me tell you, let me, before I get there, let me tell you what Bob did. Bob was, uh, uh, he was on the Southern, oops, I, I transported, I did it too fast here. Bob was on the Southern end of the island, and uh, he was watching the Japanese in two machine gun, uh, two caves with machine guns cross firing out over a battlefield and the machine guns were just mowing down not only soldiers, but medics who were coming to their rescue. The medics had uh, the, the white cross on their helmets and they were not supposed to be targeted uh, as uh, one of the rules of war, but the Japanese were using those crosses uh, as almost practice to try to hit those crosses in the helmet with their snipers. So Bob saw this and was very mad and he, he uh, loaded his um, shirt and his hands up with grenades and charged at, at, after one of the machine gun nests and blew the machine gun nest up and stopped the fire. But in the, in the process, he got shot through the belly by the other machine gun nest and uh, with his intestines hanging out, crawled back about 200 yards, filled his uh, pockets and his, his uh, shirt up with more machine gun, or more uh, grenades, and then crawled up and wiped out the other nest. And he was then taken off the battlefield and uh, died two or three days later on the ship uh, of his wounds, the infections from his wounds, and he received the Medal of Honor. So uh, my dad and, and Bob and Don had this picture taken, uh, again, shortly before they went to combat, and Bob's mother, who is on the right here, received this picture just a few days before she got word that Bob was killed. And this is the letter that she wrote to my father. I'll read it to you. Uh, this is uh, dated July 1st, 1945. Dear Harry, just got the picture and letter from your mom and I'm so thankful for it. How happy we were to get it. But Harry boy, the next day we got word our precious boy was dead, said he died of wounds received at Okinawa. If you can, would you please write us something about it? We are just hoping if it has to be so that you or his other buddy were close by and will please, please write. Tell us all about him, won't you? God bless our boys from uh, Bob's mom, Mrs. R.M. McTurious. Uh, this is a pretty powerful letter and uh, my dad still has this and let me take a picture of it. Now, uh, let me tell you before I get to the next story about uh, about the other uh, uh, other friend of the two, Don Mahoney. Um, Don Mahoney was in a battle, um, and this was close to, uh, I can't remember the Hacksaw Ridge, uh, where they made a movie out of this recently. My dad was actually walked over this, uh, this battlefield a few days after it happened, but this is a Hollywood movie that came out a few years ago. Uh, Don was in a, in a battle, and he got shot in the, uh, in the back, and he said he felt like he got hit really hard in football. The wind just got knocked out of him, and he fell down. Uh, and he could feel the air going out of his lungs, and he could feel something filling up his shirt. He wasn't sure what it was. Well, a medic came to his aid, and the medic was shot and fell on top of him and died on top of Don. 
uh, when they finally found both bodies, Don was believed to be dead and they took him back to Red Gray's registration where they were going to register him with his dog tags and put him in a body bag and find a place to bury him. But one of the soldiers saw Don move his toe and they realized that Don was still alive. So Don was taken to a hospital. He lost uh, part of his lung, several ribs, um, and had some other injuries, but he actually survived that. And um, he, my dad saw him after the war and didn't even recognize him, was visiting a hospital looking for Bob McTurious and didn't even recognize Don because he lost 70 pounds. And then there's my father who did not sustain any injuries in combat. Okay, so let me fast forward here. This is Sugarloaf Hill was the first, uh, was the probably the most dangerous part of the island of Okinawa. And when the Marines landed on Okinawa, it wasn't like Normandy. There was, they were expecting resistance, but they basically marched on shore with no, uh, with no firing of any guns or any combat action. When they got to the middle of the island, uh, there was a neck in the island and they were suspecting something was up. Well, the Japanese had had several years to prepare for this battle. This was a key uh, island because it had a landing strip that would allow the American bombers to fly directly uh, to Tokyo and to bomb Tokyo without having to make any stops. So they could fly to Tokyo and come back and land on Okinawa. So it was a key island. The, the Japanese knew this and they were prepared for the American invasion. Sugarloaf Hill was uh, full of caves and secret hiding places. And the Japanese had four years to prepare with food and ammunition and everything to sustain life. And so on this hill, the Americans were trying to take this hill and they would send up a hundred Marines on top to take it and seven would come back. And then they sent another platoon up and five would come back. And it took seven platoons to finally take this hill over the course of three or four days. The general of the Japanese army had told his soldiers to t every every soldier was responsible for one square meter of this valley, and any time an American entered that square meter, they were either to shoot him with a rifle through a sniper or with a machine gun or a mortar, and that was how they defended this part of the island because it would allow the Americans to go north and south on the island. So my dad appears in this battle towards the towards the last part of the battle, and he's. 400 yards away with his with his buddy in a foxhole and he's watching uh, the machine gun fire and watching what's happening. You couldn't see the Japanese on this hill because there, there were caves and they would poke a, a rifle or a machine gun out and then take it back in. So it was very hard to determine where the enemy was. But my dad was watching a, a Japanese soldier with a box run from rock to rock. And as soon as he got to the second rock, the machine gun fire would start again. So he realized that this was, was an ammo bearer. He was taking ammunition to the machine gun nests. So he timed up uh, the, the soldier as he was running from rock to rock, and he used everything he learned in, in sniper school, the distance, the, 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 the wind velocity, the temperature, the trajectory, and he fired his rifle before this, this Japanese soldier left the rock to go run to the next rock. And he dropped him, he hit him. And that was the, that was the last Japanese fire uh, or um, uh, uh, shots that were, that were shot by the Japanese on that hill. So they were able to take the hill, but that was my dad's first um, uh, uh, kill of a Japanese soldier. Here's a picture of uh, Don Mahoney, this guy right here on the left, uh, Bob McTurious's uh, brother Basil and my father. And this is a monument that was built in honor of Bob at his home in Altoona, Florida, which is now a national monument. And so this was the, the dedication ceremony of this uh, uh, tribute monument. And there's Don Mahoney. This was, I think, in the late 90s. Uh, two summers ago, we went to Florida and this is my dad walking back to, Don, to, to Bob's house where he visited in 1946, he spent a, a, a week with uh, Bob's mother and father telling them about their son and their friendship. And we walked back into Bob's room that he grew up in. And this is his burial uh, plot in a cemetery nearby that my dad visited two years ago. It was a pretty powerful, moving moment. 
Um, this uh, another picture of my dad in combat. There's another picture that my dad found in a World War II book. And then there's an interesting picture here of a lady named Andrea Tibbetts. And this was at my dad's 90th birthday party at his house in Columbus. And Andrea Tibbetts was a, a, a woman that he met in the gym. And as they got talking, that he found out that Andrea Tibbetts was the wife of Paul Tibbetts. It was his second wife. Well, Paul Tibbetts lived uh, five minutes from where I grew up and we didn't know it. But Paul Tibbetts was the pilot that flew the Enola Gay that dropped the first atomic bomb on Japan. So Andrea was invited to the birthday party and I heard my dad tell her that he didn't have a chance to meet Paul, but he wanted to thank her because if it had it not been for her husband dropping the atomic bomb, their next, their next uh, military engagement would have been the invasion of Japan. And they knew that there would be heavy casualties and they probably would have not survived the war. So uh, I, just, I just tell you these stories to, to uh, most of you probably appreciate veterans and those that defend our country, but there's three men here um, that I have deep gratitude for. And I think we all need to appreciate and pay respect to anybody in uniform or who has served in uniform because the sacrifice that they make and their willingness to make those sacrifices can never really be repaid. Uh, we're going to talk briefly now about uh, flexibility fitness. And uh, I just want to try to review with you the key points. Again, I showed you that animals, nature teaches us how to live. And these positions, these body positions of animals are telling us that animals are fast, they're flexible, they're limber, and they have to be this way in order to survive. They either have to run after their their food or they have to be able to run away from it and hide. And so they have to be flexible. And here we're seeing that they're all stretching. So the, the question I have for all of you is, when was the last time any of you did anything like this to stretch your body? And the answer is most of us do very little and we end up with a lot of musculoskeletal problems. We've talked about the three universal laws that apply uh, to really everything in nature and it applies to flexibility, the law of balance and harmony, the law of order and sequence, and the law of interdependence and independence. And so I gave you examples of these in the, in the lecture uh, that was released on Sunday. Here's a great example of the balance of, uh, and harmony of muscle flexibility. When one muscle tightens and flexes, the other muscle has to relax. If you don't have that balance and harmony, then you impair or restrict the movement of a joint. Uh, now, most of us don't have issues with moving our arm uh, and flexing it and fully extending it. But because we sit, we do have a lot of problems with tightness in our hip flexors and weakness in our buttocks muscles. And this certainly would Im impact our running ability, but more importantly, can cause uh, back pain if we sit too much. The next example of order and sequence is called the kinetic chain of movement. And this image shows you that any movement that we do is, involves more than one joint. And a lot of the athletic movements we do uh, really activates almost every joint of the body. So throwing a baseball really uses every joint from the toes to the fingertips and everything in between. So if any one of these uh, joints along this kinetic chain is impaired or dysfunctional or injured or not functioning properly, it will affect the, the mechanics, it will affect the velocity and the ability to uh, move the joints and move the body and with the end result being you won't be able to throw the ball as fast or as far. Now, most of you have no interest in you know, uh, pitching, but you, you have to have healthy joints that all work together and they all function together. If you've got an injury someplace, for example, a sh shoulder pain, and you don't understand this kinetic chain of movement, you may never get it fixed. I had uh, shoulder problems two years ago, and I thought I understood where the problem was coming from, and I worked and worked and worked on it, but it didn't correct itself until the pectoral muscles of the chest were stretched because they were too tight, and that was where the real problem was. So if we take any of the, these joints out of the picture, let's say, let's say this person has terrible arthritis in their knee, or a blister on their toe, 
or they've got that arthritis in their hip and it hurts to bend the hip, then obviously you're not going to be able to throw the ball as well. So athletes want to make sure every one of these joints is functional, is strong, has a full range of motion, and in particular that the core muscles are strong because a lot of the energy that is that is developed as you start to, to wind up to throw a ball gets transmitted through the core muscles of the abdo abdominal area and the low back. And if those, if those aren't strong, it will impair your ability to finish the motion. Here's another great example of, uh, of this kinetic chain. So imagine this pitcher has a, a cut knee or imagine they have a, a blister on their finger. It's going to impact the ability of them to move this chain in the proper order and sequence. Here's another great example of interdependence. So swinging a golf club requires that all of these muscles and all of these ligaments and joints work together in perfect harmony and in the perfect order and sequence and and they work together and so a perfect golf swing really looks like an easy swing it's a full range of motion but it doesn't look like you're trying to muscle the swing it looks like it's very natural and that's what happens when your joints work interdependently together in the proper sequence and timing and that's what's so hard for many of us who like to golf it's such a, a, a challenging task to develop this, but the more interdependence you get with the joints, uh, the, the better you'll be able to play the game of golf. So how do we lose uh, flexibility? Well, we violate these natural laws. We have imbalances in our muscles and joints through inactivity or disuse. Often these cause injury. We can have poor or imbalanced posture. We can have an incorrect sequence of this kinetic chain of movement because something, some joint in that chain has been disrupted or is, is injured. We can have uncorrected biomechanical defects. We can have old injuries that aren't healing or haven't been fully rehabilitated. We can have oxidative stress to the connective tissue proteins that cause these proteins to become stiffer and allow us not to have the full range of motion. And we talked about the last several weeks we talked about diet, all these type of uh, injuries, oxidative stresses that can cause the connective tissue proteins to not be fully functional and operate the way they're supposed to. And this is a great example of how just sitting, just a little bit of poor posture can lead to all kinds of problems. You see this guy sitting at the desk, desk probably started his, uh, his, project here on the computer with fairly decent posture. After an hour or two, though, the head moves forward as he's straining to look at the screen. The, 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 uh, sh the chest tightens up, the arms come forward, and everything starts to tighten. When you have your, your head in perfect alignment with your spine, there's 12 pounds of pressure shooting, putting pressure on your neck. That's basically the weight of your, uh, your skull and your head. When the head comes forward just a few degrees, now there's 32 pounds of pressure exerting uh, its, its uh, gravitational forces on the neck, which means the neck muscles are fighting more uh, weight to hold the head erect. And then when you're sitting in the position that this gentleman is sitting in, now it's 42 pounds of pressure. So if he sits this way all day long, that's 42 pounds of pressure that the neck muscles have to assume to hold the head upright. So they've been tightening up and stressed all day. So what you're going to have with this kind of posture is neck pain, shoulder pain, and often headaches. And then you go see a doctor who says, well, you have migraine headaches. Here's Imitrex. Here's something for a vascular migraine when it's really a tension migraine and we've misdiagnosed the problem and we're not treating it correctly. There's a, a condition called upper cross and lower cross syndrome. And this posture is actually creating both problems because the upper cross condition uh, is causing uh, tight uh, muscles in the, the, the trapezius muscle and the levator muscle that elevates the scapula. And it's causing weakness in the deep cervical muscles here because they're not being used. Then you have weaknesses in the, the lower muscles of the low back, the lower trap and serratus anterior muscles, because they're not being used at all. And you have tightness in the chest muscles as the arms are forward, and you have tightness in these muscles uh, in the front of the neck as the neck is being held down. 
So all of these things are leading to all of these defects with tight muscles and weak muscles are leading to shoulder pain, um, headaches, chest pain, bursitis of the shoulder, and sometimes even um, uh, uh, tennis elbow and carpal tunnel syndrome, all from repetitive stress with poor posture. That's upper cross syndrome. Lower cross syndrome leads to very tight muscles in the, in the low back, the mid to low back. And you have an inhibition uh, and a lack of muscle use of the abdominal muscles, so they get weak. Then you have weak gluteal or buttocks muscles because these muscles are being stretched as you sit there and you have tight muscles in the, in the hip flexor muscles right here because they're actually uh, shortened because you're at a, a 90 degree angle. And if you sit for a long time and then stand up, you'll stand up like an old person. You'll stand up with your with you bent forward and you'll realize that doesn't look right. I've got to stand up straight. And how do you overcome that? Well, you have to over you have to use these muscles of your low back, and then they will get fatigued if you stand for a long time. You're you you have weak uh, muscles of the buttocks that will cause you to want to lean forward a little bit because the hip flexors are so tight. So this is lower cross syndrome. So there are there are remedies for this. We have to address each of these. So for the tight upper levator scapula muscles, we can take weights and keep our shoulders back and let the weights pull on the on the uh, the trap muscle here and the neck muscles and naturally stretch them. Then we need to develop strength in these deep cervical muscles. You'll you'll know if you have this problem if you lay down flat and just and tuck your chin into your chest and then lift your head one or two inches off the floor. Within 10 to 20 seconds, if your head starts to shake uh, and wiggle, you'll know that these hip, these deep cervical muscles are weak because you have upper cross syndrome. That's the telltale sign that you've got this problem. So try this sometime. Just try tucking your chest, your chin into your chest, lifting your head just a little bit off the, the floor or off the surface you're laying on and see if you can hold your head motionless. If you can't, if it shakes, uh, you have problems with uh, weakness of these cervical muscles because of poor posture of the way you're sitting. Then you have this uh, strengthening. We got to strengthen the lower trap muscles. So this is one exercise to strengthen the lower trap muscles. And another one, well, another one would be to stretch the muscles in the front, the chest muscles and the uh, the neck muscles. We're stretching the muscles here that are tight on the neck, and we're stretching the chest muscles, the pectoral muscles that have uh, that have been tightened because our arms are forward. Another way to stretch the arms is to stick them straight out. Uh, at, a, at, at a perpendicular angle to the body to stretch the pectoral muscles as you uh, rest yourself on a ball like this. Then we can also strengthen these low back muscles right here by a, a pull down where you reach up towards the top of the door and then pull your arms straight back, squeezing the shoulder blades together. And this is where you should feel the tension in your shoulders. And that will help you. I just saw somebody today that's got this problem. I could feel uh, the bottom of her scapula coming off the, the rib cage because the muscles are tight. And this tells me she's got this problem. Another way to stretch the pectoral muscles is simply to put your arms on a, on a, a door jam and walk forward and feel the stretch in your chest muscles as you hold this position. Then we have to do something to, to fix this problem in the low back and we have to do something for the abdominal muscles. This is part of the rehab for the lower cross syndrome. So this cat camel stretch is a great stretch. And what you wanna do is when you hold this position and tuck your chin in, like you're looking at your chest, you hold that position as you start to lean back and put your buttocks down on your, uh, on your, your heels. And as you go through that motion, you'll really feel that stretch your low back right here. It's a wonderful stretch. Uh, another way to do this is simply grab your knees and, and pull them as tight as you can, trying to stretch the low back here. You should be able to feel that low back stretch. Then we have to strengthen the abdominal muscles. We don't necessarily have to do that with, with um, uh, crunches or sit-ups because that tightens the hip flexors. But if we do a plank maneuver where we just hold our body stiff, that's the best way to strengthen the abs. Here's another way where you're either on your knees or on your toes. The idea is you want to hold this as long as you can and repeat this as often as you can. 
and this will not injure your back and it'll not tighten your hip flexors. So this is a very safe way to strengthen the abdominal muscles. I can't overemphasize the importance of this. If you're starting to have back stiffness or back pain, you absolutely have to start doing these exercises. Then the last part of the lower cross syndrome is strengthening the weak gluteal muscles. And the best way to do that is a lunge. As you go down and push yourself back up, you're activating the gluteal muscles to do this. Uh, if you make your gluteal muscles sore from these lunges, your back pain, your, the gluteal muscles will tighten the, the lower spine and, and it will help your back feel better. The best way to stretch the tight psoas muscle, the hip flexor muscle, which is right here, is, is this same maneuver because you're, you're stretching the hip flexors right there and those are the ones that get tight when you sit in this position all day with both legs. The key with this particular maneuver is you wanna keep your body straight upright. If you do this and you're leaning forward, you're not getting the hip flexor stretched. So if you push your body to be uh, straight up and down as you're stretching here, you'll really feel the pull in there. The other key uh, warning here is that when you do these lunges, you need to take a big enough step that when you go down to 90 degrees, that your knee is in line with your ankle. You never want your knee uh, past your toe. So if your step is too short, and you bend down to 90 degrees and the knee is past the toe, that's too much pressure on your knee that can hurt your knee. So this is a really safe stretch. Uh, and you don't necessarily have to go down all the way. If you can't do that, then go down half half of this, uh, this, half to this position and then come back up and balance yourself if you need to with a counter or a chair. The idea is to start to stretch the hip flexor and start to strengthen the gluteal muscles. Today, I did this maneuver 10 times uh, with each leg with 35 pounds in each hand. And I, I went all the way down. I did two sets. And the rest of the day in the gym, my gluteal muscles were just, I would start to squat and they were starting to shake and shimmer because they were so fatigued. So I'm going to be sore tomorrow, but the next couple of days, my back pain is going to feel much better. So this is what we're talking about, the upper cross and lower cross syndrome from usually from too much sitting. Uh, again, you can have bursitis in the shoulder. You can have neck pain, shoulder pain, headaches. You can have low back pain. You can have hip flexor pain, all because of this, this cross syndrome where you've got muscles that are tight and muscles that are weak, and they all have to be fixed. If you have this body position where your, your butt kind of sticks up and your hips are, your, your belly sticks out and your, your belt goes down at this angle, that's because the buttocks muscles are too weak, the abdominal muscles are too weak, the hip flexors are too tight, the lumbar spine is too tight. So you want to be able to look in the mirror and look at yourself sideways with your belt line going straight across, across parallel to the floor. If your belt is going down and your hips are going, they're tilted forward, that's too much pressure on the low back, too much hip uh, flexor tightness, the head's going to come forward, and this is not the posture you want. This is the posture that you should have here on the left. Again, another image, the same image, showing you the muscles that are involved. These are the hip flexor muscles that get short if you sit a long time. So these have to be straightened uh, and, and stretched. And I'll, I'll illustrate to you in a couple of weeks what happens with back pain when this is not uh, corrected. So becoming more uh, flexible will help you in a lot of ways. First of all, it'll help prevent injuries because uh, it counters the shortening that occurs when muscles are repeatedly used. Uh, so especially those, those exercises or those activities you do all day long over and over again. If you don't do something that's just the opposite of that movement, you're gonna end up with muscle imbalances, muscle weaknesses, and then the other side of that, the, the agonistic or antagonistic side is going to be too weak. So becoming flexible will help you have healthier joints. It'll increase the range of motion. You'll be able to walk and move and, and jog and run like a young person. But you can tell when someone is stiff uh, in their joints by the way they walk, the way they move, the way they run. And we all, we, it's not that we all have to be able to run, but we all need to be flexible. So flexibility helps you in everyday movement, it helps you in posture, and it significantly improves your athletic performance for those of you who are still trying to be athletic. 
So how do you become more flexible? Well, you have to understand your body mechanics. So find somebody that can help you with this. Make sure that everything is working properly. And if you have a muscle that's not, or a joint that's not moving properly, you got to figure out what's weak and what's tight and get it corrected. Dr. Jacobowski, our local chiropractor, is going to speak to us in a couple of weeks about that. He's a great, excellent resource for this. Someone who does sports medicine can help you with this. An orthopedic surgeon can probably help you with the, the body mechanics and try to get help you get this corrected. Uh, so here are some other experts that can help you identify this. We want to restore normal balance range of motion of every joint. And we need to commit to stretching uh, 10 to 15 minutes a day. So here's a couple of other principles. If your muscles are tight, that's not because they're strong necessarily. It's a sign of weakness. The muscle that is tight is tight because you haven't used it and it knows you haven't used it and it's trying to protect you from injuring that muscle with a sudden jerk or a movement you haven't practiced doing. And so it tightens up to prevent you from tearing the muscle fibers. So flexibility is actually a sign of muscle strength. And one way you can quickly assess your flexibility is stand with your feet together, your knees locked, and reach down and see how far you can go with your hands. You should at least be able to put your fingers on, the, on your toes. Uh, if you can't do that, then your low back and your hamstrings are, are way too tight. Ideally, you should be able to stand with your legs and knees uh, locked and put your palms of your hand on the floor. That would be the goal for almost all of us. So the ideal muscle is both flexible and strong. Okay, so we want to talk a little bit about arthritis because all of us are going to have some arthritis at some point. It's just wear and tear on the joints. Some of us have, are, develop arthritis faster and it advances quicker in some than others. But for all of us, if our joints are not moving properly and our muscles aren't strong and flexible, that sets us up for accelerated arthritic development. So it's a chemical or mechanical stress on a joint that's not moving correctly over, re over time repeatedly. And the inflammation and pain are due to the repeated misuse of the joint. It can be made worse by dietary oxidative stress as we talked about sugars in particular. Um, and it can increase, inactivity will reduce the blood flow to these joints and reduce the lymphatic flow. So we're gonna have more cellular debris more inflammation, more arthritis, more pain, and we're not gonna to wanna to move that joint. And if that's the way we live, our joints are gonna lock up and freeze and not be able to move the way we want them because calcium deposition will take place and then everything's gonna get stiff. So we all have to keep moving, have to keep stretching. So how do you heal an arthritic joint? Well, you try to restore the normal range of motion by fixing the problem. Uh, I, I have a massage twice a, a month and it is painful. There are, there are muscles in my legs and in my upper back that are very tight from repetitive use from the activities I'm doing. But when I leave, I feel so much better. My range of motion improves so much. The inflammation and the tightness of those muscles and ligaments are completely worked out. You need to see a qualified therapist, chiropractor, or massage therapist to help you with these joints. Um, and then you want to reduce the joint stress by improving your posture. And then these are some ways to reduce oxidative stress, the chemical part of this oxidative stress that causes arthritic pain. And remember, increasing activity enhances blood flow. And for some of you, if you can get in a swimming pool and start moving in a swimming pool, take gravity out of the picture, you'll get your joints to move in a way they haven't moved in a long time because they would otherwise be painful. And, and yoga classes and stretch band therapy, these are excellent activities that any of us could start at any point. We don't have to look like the instructor. We have to, you know, we're going to look like what we look like. But as we continue, we're going to gain more flexibility, better balance, and better range of motion of our joints. Uh, then you had Coach Hartzell demonstrate uh, some flexibility exercises. And he showed you at the age of 80 that he's still capable of doing the splits. He can actually do the splits in both ways. So some of the lessons we learned from him. First of all, flexibility can be improved at any age. Just as this lady started running the 100-yard dash at 100, if you're 75, you can start now with stretching with the bands and become more flexible. It will help you. 
Coach Hartzell talks about movement. Movement increases or enhances blood flow, and blood is what heals us. He often quotes Leviticus, uh, I think it's 1711, um, where it says life is in the blood. That's a spiritual reference, but it's also a, 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 a temporal reference to the body. If you are, if you have surgery and you have poor blood flow because you're a smoker or a diabetic, your healing is going to be much slower. So there's no question that the better your blood flows, the faster you will heal. Dr. Jacobowski will talk about spine health and the health of the discs in your back in a few weeks. The best way to help the discs heal is to get nutrients in the discs. And you don't do that when you sit and you don't move. You get that with movement. So movement is the major uh, remedy against arthritis pain. Another point that Dr. Coach Hartzell says is that ice is for your drinks, not your joints. And I agree with this. There's nothing that proves that putting ice on a sore shoulder or an injured muscle is going to accelerate the healing. The ice, we do know that it slows down the nervous impulse of pain to the brain. But as soon as the tissue warms up again, the pain comes back. It really doesn't do anything for long-term inflammation. Um, we talk about the rice theory, and which is uh, rest, ice, uh, compress, and elevate. And the author of this recently, uh, probably three or four years ago, recanted this acronym RICE. And he took away rest and ice as, as part of the, the therapy treatment plan. Most people don't know this. Coach Hartzell says rest, which is the first treatment, that's for the deceased. There's plenty of time for that when we're, we're not moving anymore. But until, we're, until that day, we all need to keep moving. Ice, again, is for your drinks. It doesn't help the healing in anything. It might relieve pain temporarily, but it doesn't enhance the speed of healing. Compression, yes. Compression squeezes the inflammation out of the joints. Um, and then when you relieve that pressure of the compression, then you get blood flow into the joint and that blood with all of its oxygen and healing nutrients can help the joint to heal. Elevation is also a recommended therapy because elevation helps to remove the lymphatic drainage uh, or a lymphatic buildup in the tissue that occurs with injury. It's all part of the acute inflammatory process, which is perfectly designed for each of us. But when we have chronic inflammation, when you sprain your ankle and somebody put, puts a boot on that ankle and says, now don't move this because you just tore some ligaments, you're going to have chronic inflammation. You will have more pain. You'll have lower, slower healing. That is not a good therapy. Please do not let somebody put a boot or an air cast on a sprained ankle. That's going to slow everything down. Um, bands can help some with headaches. Coach Hartzell demonstrated this. If you have a vascular headache that's caused by uh, blood flow dilation in, on the top of your brain, that's a vascular headache. The bands won't help that. But at least half of all headaches or tension headaches. They're tension headaches in the back of the skull here where the muscles of the neck attach on your skull, just as we showed you in those previous pictures. Putting the band on that muscle right over the knob on the back of your head, right underneath that knob in the middle of your head and wrapping that band around tight can help to stretch those muscles and give you relief of the tension headaches within 15 seconds. It's, it's pretty incredible. Um, compression coupled with traction movement of joints diminishes pain and swelling. Coach Hartchell demonstrated this with the ankle. And I've had this experience with patients in my office. I've never had somebody come into my office with an ankle sprain who came in with crutches, have to use those crutches when they've left. Within 15 minutes, they're walking either pain-free or with minimal pain after I compress their ankle with a, with a compression band, and then I traction the ankle, I pull on the ankle as they move it. As they move that ankle against traction, we're moving the inflammation out of the joint, and then we release the band, and the blood surges in, and their pain goes away, and their healing is starting to occur. This happened over and over and over again. One of the first times I had this experience was I was admitting a patient in the emergency room, and I was listening to his lungs, and in the bed right next to this patient, there was a curtain drawn, and I heard the emergency room doctor tell this 16-year-old girl, the good news is you didn't break anything in your ankle. I'm going to put you in an air cast and give you some pain medicines, and I want you to go see your family doctor in a week. 
When the doctor walked away, I pulled the curtain back and I said, I want you to stay here and wait for me. I'll be back in 20 minutes. She looked at me and they were slow in the emergency room. So I went home and I got my bands and I did Coach Hartzell's treatment on this 16-year-old girl. She was in tears because of the pain. She was afraid I was going to hurt her. I reassured her that I wouldn't hurt her. 20 minutes later, she left the emergency room with one out of 10 pain without any crutches or any, any other therapies needed because this works so, so well. So this week, I, I want you to stop drinking your soft drinks because they're acidic um, and uh, they they're very high in oxidative stress. Uh, we can measure this by the oxidation reduction potential. And then again, you're going to cut back on alcohol and tobacco, particularly tobacco. But I, I don't want people stressed out. I'm not asking you to quit smoking or chewing tobacco if those are your habits, because I don't want to stress you with uh, too many change behaviors. But I want to prepare you to wean yourself down from both of these. And I'm not saying, you know, you can never have a beer or wine or a mixed drink. But if you're someone that drinks, you know, more than a couple of times a week, you're probably drinking more than you should for your health. Then I want you to start stretching 10 minutes a day and uh, commit to doing that. And so we have these other assignments to complete the workbooks uh, uh, on your own to help you develop better understanding of how to change behaviors. So next week, we're going to talk about cardiovascular fitness, what it is the benefits, how you develop cardiovascular fitness, why you need to warm up, and how do you ma maintain it once you achieve it. Please don't think that I'm going to ask you all to start running a 5K or telling you that you've got to run to, to get cardiovascular fit. Uh, that's not it. You're going to find there's two levels of cardiovascular fitness, and the first level is something that any of us can achieve and start getting the benefits from. So that's the, uh, the end of the presentation. I'm going to uh, see if I can um, take this off so we can have a discussion and look at questions that you might have. Okay. So anybody out there have questions they, they would like to ask me? There was a question. I don't know if Chris is going to put it up. Okay. It... Did you see it, Kelly? Yeah. Is there a special type of office chair or padding to add that you would recommend? Sitting at a desk all day causes a lot of lower back pain and poor posture. So they're they're admitting that, yeah, it does definitely cause this. It's amazing. You wouldn't think that that happens. Um, I don't know if there's a special type of chair or a padding. I do know that you want to keep your shoulders back. Uh, you want to keep your head straight and try to keep your eyes at the level of your screen so you're not looking down because that tightens the, the muscles here and stretches the muscles in the back. Um, you want to keep your uh, maybe a box where you keep your feet slightly uh, up off the floor. And probably most importantly, keep your elbows like they're glued to your hips. As soon as your elbow comes away from your hips, you're activating the muscles in your in your shoulders where the bursitis occurs. So I've seen plenty of people with shoulder bursitis because they've got their right arm on a mouse, you know, three quarters of the day as they're on their computer. So make sure you keep your shoulders back, stick your chest way out and keep your elbows as close to your hips as they can. That leaves your hands free to move, but you're not pulling your shoulders I don't know if you can see this this way. You want your shoulders back as far as they can get them, and that will help a lot. Uh, but if you're sitting a lot, one of the things you should do is remember every hour to get up and walk around. I have a big Swiss ball right here in my office, and if I start feeling that tension, I'll come back to the office and I'll lay on it and just let everything fall back the opposite direction. It's a wonderful stretch. It can be really helpful. So I would encourage everybody who's sitting all day long to get up every hour and do something to stretch the opposite way. Put your arms back, put, look up at the ceiling with your head and, and reach back and stretch the opposite way. So I hope that helps. Um, Dr. Jacobowski might be able to answer the question about chair or padding because I, I don't know, have an answer to that. Any other questions? Okay, uh, can you describe the benefit of sitting on 
the Pilates ball. Pilates yeah. Ball. I think the Pilates ball that he's talking about is the big Swiss ball. Versus uh, a stand up desk? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think the stand up desk is great for uh, a, a lot of us because it does, it, it eliminates the postural changes it causes from prolonged sitting. Um, I personally couldn't stand all day because by low back, it gets really tight from standing. I can feel it actually tighten up now after standing up here for an hour because I have this lower cross syndrome. Uh, but for some people, I, th I think it's a good idea. So, but I, I don't think, it, some people can stand all day. Um, I can't do that, but it probably wouldn't be bad for me to have that. In fact, I tried to get one of these in my office. Uh, the Pilates ball is excellent because uh, it forces you to, as you're moving on the ball, it's changing your balance and your spine has to react to that and your, your balance has to react to it. So you're actually activating the tiny muscles along your spine that's really good for core strength. You wouldn't think that you're not feeling tension with that. You wouldn't think that that would help the core strength, but it really does. So it's a great, uh, it's a great thing to have. And some people sit on those balls at work. Um, uh, so Dr. Jacobowski is going to show that in a couple of weeks when we talk about back pain. But I think both of those are great solutions to this problem that develops because of lower cross syndrome because of the prolonged sitting. So I, I like that question. I like both of those remedies. How about any other questions? They did ask if we could repost the site of Dr. Hartzell's band so they can get in and purchase if they like. Okay. Yeah, I, I apologize. Uh, Coach Hartzell had uh, a minor surgical procedure last week and he called me, said everything went well. I, we've been playing phone tag. I've been trying to reach him to ask him for his uh, website where you can get the bands or more information about the bands. So I will find that out and I will post that on our Facebook page uh, as soon as I get it. I, I tried calling him today as well. So just haven't been able to connect. Uh, but uh, he, he's excellent. I mean, his, you know, he's worked with Ohio State. He's, uh, he's rehabilitated some top end athletes in, in every, at every profession. His bands are in the NBA, the NFL, Major League Baseball. He was actually the first inventor of this. And unfortunately, his marketing technique and his business acumen uh, didn't allow him to take it to the world place market like it could have. A lot of people have sort of copied his ideas and are now uh, doing very well with it. But he, he's, uh, his techniques are very, very effective. And he is sort of the author of all these bands that we're stretching with. So I'll, I'll get you that as soon as I can and post it. Um, we also, I, I've been trying to post short little video vignettes that Dr. Jakubowski and I are doing in his gym on the Facebook page. And we're showing you uh, these exercises and these, these uh, remedies for upper and lower cross syndrome. So I encourage you guys to check out those uh, videos because uh, seeing it in real time and seeing the body positions that we're trying to demonstrate as we... Uh, illustrate these, I think uh, it would be very helpful for you. I, I just encourage all of you to understand this and put this into practice as much as you can because it will eliminate so many problems down the road. Any other questions? Yes. Um, okay, so yeah, so if you, that's a that's a great question. So if you stand for a long time and you have all these stresses on your body, um, you have to think about what's being stretched, uh, stressed. And probably most of us tend to have these upper and lower cross syndromes. So all those exercises and stretches that I showed you for upper and lower cross syndrome are designed to help you to be able to stand for longer periods of time without having as much uh, pressure on those joints and stress on those muscles. So strengthen the gluteal muscles, stretch the hip flexors, strengthen the abdominal muscles, stretch the low back muscles with the cat camel stretch, um, stretch the chest muscles, uh, the, the pectoral muscles, strengthen the, uh, the lower uh, trap muscles with rows and with the other exercises. Those are all great things to do. The other thing I would add is if you're standing on heart service, uh, try to stand on a soft, um, pad or something, some kind of a cushion, because remember what gravity is doing. And the second, I don't know, the second law of 
physics, uh, thermodynamics, I'm not sure which one it is, but for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. You've got, you've got a, the weight of your body pushing down on the floor, but the floor is also pushing up on your body with that same pressure. So your knees and your hips with prolonged standing, especially if you're heavier, are gonna take a beating. And so ha standing on a cushion can help reduce the impact of that stress. Um, I, if, I, if I had, to, had a, sh a job where I had to stand for a long period of time, I would try to take as many breaks as I could to either lay down and stretch or sit down and stretch because uh, you need to change those body positions to give those muscles a break. It may not be practical, but that would be the probably the best solution in addition to addressing the upper and lower cross syndrome. Those are all great questions. I, I, I feel you. I mean, I know what that pain feels like and I know how much it helps when you do these um, stretches, it can make all the difference. You, you just be amazed at how much better you can move, how much better you feel. Yes, it's, it's from poor posture. You probably, your arms are forward, your chest muscles are tight, pulling your shoulders in, the muscles in your back here are being stretched. And what happens is the scapula back here, it starts to come away from the, um, the chest wall and it can cause a lot of problems. I, 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 I've been through that. I know what that feels like. A lot of pain up in here because these muscles are tight and they actually pull the scapula up. So this needs to be treated and stretched sometimes with chiropractic or massage therapy. And then the lower trap muscles, need to be strengthened with the rowing exercises we demonstrated, Dr. Jakubowski and I demonstrated, or the other exercises that I showed you on this on the presentation tonight, where you strengthen the lower trap muscles with putting your arms back like this or pulling down on a on a uh, on a on a band that's giving you resistance. So um, again, if you're local and you need help with this, see a chiropractor. Dr. Baker is excellent in Steubenville. Dr. Jakubowski is excellent here in Denison. I okay. Can't get in this. I'm frozen. <laughs> okay. Well, if there's no more questions, you can you can if you think of them, post them on the website. I appreciate you guys uh, all being active and encouraging each other and sharing your uh, your struggles and your successes and sharing your recipes. I think it's a great group dynamic. I think you're being very supportive, and uh, Kelly and I just enjoy being part of this and and watching all of you work together to get healthier. So. We'll see you next week. We will look forward to our next uh, presentation. And please stay in touch if you have any questions. And we'll share Dr. or Coach Hartzell's uh, contact information as soon as we get it. So have a great week. Enjoy the nice weather. And we'll see you next week.